Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Um, I am Salman Sheikh, of course, uh, director of the Brookings Doha Center. Um, welcome, distinguished guests, friends of the BDC. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to start this, uh, this event today on the future of the US GCC security cooperation and regional security. Um, I'm extremely excited that I have three great panelists uh, with us uh, today. Um, all three of them, as well as some of you in the audience who I'd like to welcome, have been attending our annual uh, Brookings U.S. Islamic uh, World Forum, um, which I think, again, was a, a, a great success, allowed us to really get into uh, some of the issues related to uh, the United States and the Muslim communities around the world. Um, let us go straight into it. Um, I, let me introduce our panelists. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to have um, Madam Ibtisam Kedbi from uh, the founder and president of the Emirates Policy Center and, of course, the professor of political science at the United Arab Emirates University. She's also on the board of the Association of Political Sciences and trustees in the Arab Organization for Transparency and is also a consultative board member of the Arabic Thought Foundation. Previously, she served as the Secretary General of the Gulf Development Forum and was a team member of the groundbreaking um, Arabic Human Development Report in 2006. Uh, you have a long list of achievements um, in addition to that, which I could go on and on, but I would just say, of course, you received your PhD in political science at the Faculty of Economics and Political Sciences in Cairo University. Um, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Then it's my great pleasure to introduce, of course, uh, Tamara Wittis, my boss, um, uh, who, of course, is a senior fellow and the director of the Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Tamara served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs um, from uh, late 2009 to the start of January 2012, coordinating US policy on democracy and human rights in the Middle East. Of course, that period, uh, the start of the Arab uh, revolutions. Um, she also oversaw the Middle East Partnership Initiative and served as Deputy Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions. Um, also, I could go on and on, but uh, uh, let, us, uh, let us move on to my next esteemed guest, who, of course, is uh, Dr. Uh, Ken Pollock, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy um, as well, uh, and was previously um, my boss um, in, in this regard. Uh, and that's right. Well, yes. <laughs> he previously held positions, of course, at the U.S. Uh, Central Intelligence Agency, the U.S. Defense Department, and the U.S. National Security Council. Um, many of you would know his research focus on the Gulf, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. His latest book is Unthinkable, Iran, the Bomb, and American Strategy, which of course is highly relevant to our uh, discussion uh, today. Um, of course, this relationship between the United States and the GCC is uh, decades old. It's a special relationship, um, and one yet which through these sort of dynamic and uh, uh, times is, is going through quite a lot of angst and, and deep thinking. Uh, the past few, see, few years have seen mounting pressures on that relationship. And of course, most recently, we have had a US, special US GCC summit in, in the middle of, of last month. So, Ebtisan, let me start with you um, in, in this regard. Did that summit, did that summit reach expectations? Um, in this current environment? Since you have interpreters, I will use them. I, I'm going to speak in Arabic. Please, if you can use your headphones. The Camp David Summit. Uh, uh, 
carried many questions and interrogations and some doubts uh, uh, on the part of the GCC countries. And I don't think they answered all the questions or satisfied all the aspirations. Before speaking about the summit, we must also speak about what went wrong in the balance of, in the GCC region. Of course, this was this disbalance that changed after the fall of Iraq and the entry of USA into Iraq and Iran's entry, which led to this a shortcoming or a strike on the balance that existed in the past. So uh, this, of course, affected the security of the Gulf. But uh, the nuclear agreement or deal with Iran has not, in the, in, in the eyes of the Gulf states, has not taken into consideration uh, the threats and the fears that uh, have uh, the GCC countries have regarding the Iranian interventions uh, and interferences in the region and in one of the states of this uh, the, the Gulf, which is the Bahrain. The GCC countries see, think that the USA had priorities uh, which focused on only striking or reaching a deal with Iran without uh, uh, disregarding uh, the Iranian interventions. Uh, and so there is a change in the priorities. The priority for the Americans were only to stop the Iranians from obtaining or being able to develop uh, a nuclear bomb. And so that the other countries of the region could not also obtain such a bomb, including the GCC countries. That's to say they wanted to stop or to hinder any uh, race, uh, arms race or nuclear arms race in the region. Of course, but uh, this, uh, reg uh, this deal uh, would be uh, not complete and would be lacking many things because it does not take into consideration that Iran is a destabilizer factor more than stabilization factor. And, and that this uh, deal will not lead to any stability in the security of the uh, GCC countries because Iran is a destabilizer factor in Iraq and in Syria and in uh, Yemen. So, unless uh, th these inter Iranian interventions are controlled and stopped, uh, and uh, the, the GCC countries doubt uh, and have some doubts that uh, the USA will be able, through this deal, to stop uh, the Iranian regime or to uh, restrict it in, in the region. The GCC countries think that the United States, especially after Obama's uh, statement that the GC countries are not uh, uh, coherent and are not uh, with, sticking with each other, while on the other side, uh, Iran represents one block. That's why he said he cannot get an understanding with the GC countries because they don't agree on one policy or one approach, uh, uh, unlike uh, Iran. That's why they think. Uh, that uh, the United States is handing over the security of the Gulf to Iran. And that's why we find there is a big gap between the American administration, the present American administration, and the GC countries. They went there with all their uh, fears and concerns. And in my opinion, what the guarantees that were uh, given will lead to militarizing the Gulf uh, region. That's to say, that, I mean, arming the GCC countries would mean that the other side would be armed also, and this will lead to a sort of uh, uh, arms race, in my modest opinion. Why, I would say, why doesn't USA uh, uh, extend its uh, nuclear network as it did with Germany uh, when it was facing the Soviet Union, or was it uh, did uh, with the, uh, in Japan to face uh, North Korea? Why is it exempting the GCC from this nuclear umbrella, uh, at least to guarantee to the GCC countries that the U.S. is really uh, concerned and uh, 
to uh, with, uh, with the security of the these countries and is protecting them from any Iranian hegemony. It is true that uh, there must be a strategic partnership between the two sides, and not as was seen by USA, that's to say only by uh, arming, no. The, the, strate the real strategic partner here for uh, USA is Israel. So why not the GC countries get the same kind of treatment or the same level of partnership if USA think that these countries are really uh, allies, and they proved, in fact, they are allies of the USA. Thank you. Tammy, well, you heard, you heard there's a number of um, very important points that Sam made with regards to lack of balance, the lack of strategic uh, partnership, as well as uh, with particularly the role of Iran. Is there anything that the United States can do at this point in order to allay some of the concerns and also give more comfort? Sure, well, Saman, thanks. And, and first, let me say what a pleasure it is to be up here with such excellent colleagues. Uh, you know, Iranian interference in the Arab world is nothing new. Uh, this has been the policy of the Islamic Republic since the revolution. What's changed is the context and the situation of the states where Iran is trying to make trouble. And it is these vulnerabilities, whether they are local grievances, um, deficits of governance, uh, local conflicts, that create opportunities for Iran, for ISIS as well, uh, to gain power, to gain influence, and to further destabilize the region. So I think we have to recognize that the challenge has been there for a long time, and the United States and its Gulf partners have worked to combat that challenge for a long time in Lebanon and elsewhere. But there's no question that the underlying instability in the region uh, has created new opportunities for Iran, and Iran has exploited those opportunities very effectively. And so the situation today is not balanced in the same way as before. And the challenge is how to create <laughs> a, a pushback strong enough to restore balance and to restore a greater degree of regional order. That does involve pushing back on Iranian behavior. It also, however, must involve dealing with the underlying conflicts and grievances and deficits that give Iran these opportunities. And I think that was a large component of the discussion at the Camp David summit. That yes, uh, the US recognizes that the nuclear deal uh, is not going to transform Iran. It's not doing the nuclear deal because it will transform Iran. And these other problematic behaviors have to be addressed. But at the same time, we, the US and the Arab states, have to work together to address the conflicts in the region that are driving the instability. So what more can we do? What I sense from the GCC states uh, is that there's a clear message to the United States that the place in the region where they would like to see more leadership from the US to push back on Iran, to address the underlying conflicts that are generating these opportunities for Iran, the place where they want to see that most is Syria. And this is also the place where the United States is most reticent, most reluctant <laughs> to get more deeply involved. Um, now, it's worth taking a minute to understand why there is this gap that, it, that Dr. Ibtissam was describing, because there is a real gap on Syria in particular. Partly it's domestic politics. Let's remember that for the United States, it's, this is still a public left, right, and center that views the wars of the last decade and a half as largely failures, we can debate that, and that is deep, deeply reluctant about the wisdom or the worthiness of greater investment or entanglement in the Middle East. So there is no pressure on the Obama administration from within the American body politic to do more in the Middle East. There is only pressure to do less. 
And then you have a situation in the region where, frankly, until very recently, within the region, there have been real divisions about how to deal with the crisis in Syria, which components of the opposition to support, in what manner, what kind of political solution should result. And these divisions within the region have made the US administration more reluctant to engage. Now, I think one of the important outcomes of the Camp David summit is some greater unity in the message from the Gulf states to the US. And we can hope that this is the beginning of a more effective dialogue. Thank you very much. Similar question to you, Ken. You're hearing that, uh, that the fears have not been allayed, particularly with regards to Iranian expansionism. You've talked about Iranian containment. And Tammy, I think, raised an issue which I think you would agree with, with regards to the litmus test of Syria. What is it that, in this relationship on the US side, they could be doing more? And how do you see um, how we've got here? Thank you, Salman. Um, I want to try very hard not to repeat tomorrow's very cogent analysis, because I agree with it. Um, and what I'd like to do instead is maybe build off of it in some ways, which is to say that um, I think that Tamara has identified very nicely uh, the basic problem uh, that the United States is facing right now. And I see it as an issue of the Obama administration. Um, I actually think that if, the, if we had an administration that were interested in doing more on Syria, I actually think that the American public would be receptive to that. I think that we've got a lot of polls that indicate that. But we have an administration that is absolutely determined not to get involved in Syria. And you know, it's something that's very striking, which is since the beginning of this conflict, the administration has advanced a half dozen reasons for not getting involved. And they've been all over the map. It started with, we can't because the Russians won't let us. Right? And then they became, well, you know, there's no group worth supporting. And then it became a, well, if we go after ISIS, we will, uh, sorry, if we go after the regime, we will turn the country over to ISIS. But now it's we're going to go after ISIS, uh, not caring whether that's going to turn the, re the country over to the regime. You know, it, again and again and again, the arguments come out, but they keep, the only thing that's consistent is they don't want to get involved. Right? I think that that is a very big mistake because I think that on, at one level, there are things that the Obama administration is saying that I think are, are smart, are reasonable, that are worth thinking about. The administration is saying that they believe that a nuclear deal with Iran would remove one potentially very destabilizing element from the region, right? No Iranian nuclear weapons program to worry about for at least 10 years. That's obviously beneficial. Uh, they also point out, again, as Tamara was pointing out, that a lot of the problems in the region are not of Iran's making, that is, Iran did not cause them, but simply of Iran's exploiting. We have a series of civil wars in the region, and the Iranians are doing their best to make those civil wars worse and to try to take advantage of them as best they can. Again, a very reasonable analysis of the problem. I think the, the real issue comes in, though, that at that point, it's fair to say, well, fine, uh, what are you going to do about those civil wars? Right? And that's where I think the administration really falls down, and I think that's where Syria looms large. I have problems with what the administration is doing on Iraq, but they're of a lesser magnitude than with Syria. Uh, on Yemen, I actually think that what the administration is doing is more or less correct, and I would say that I don't think that the U.S. should be more supportive of an aggressive policy toward intervention in Yemen. I do not think that that is going to be beneficial to anyone, not the GCC, not the Yemenis, not anyone, certainly not the United States. And as an American, I don't see American interests in, involved in, uh, in Yemen. Syria is the different story. Right. Syria is an arena where I think that we can push back on Iran, and I think that one of the mistakes that the administration has made, and I don't know if they mean it or it's just another excuse for inaction, is this idea that somehow if the U.S. were more aggressive and assertive in Syria, that it would scuttle the Iran nuclear deal or the Iranians would attack us in Iraq, all of which I think is nonsense. 
but which I've heard senior administration officials repeatedly intone as rationales for why they didn't want to do more in Syria. Again, I also think that it's certainly the case that Syria is a mess, but there are ways to deal with it. We've seen other civil wars in the past, I think increasingly, both in the academic literature and in our policy experiences, we are figuring out how you deal with these situations. It's not impossible, it is difficult, it does require a very significant commitment of effort and resources, much greater than what the administration has been willing to commit to. But again, if the administration isn't willing to do that, and again, I think it's a mistake for them to do so, I think it's fair for the GCC to come back and say, then what is it you are planning to do with these problems that Iran has exploited? I just want to pick up on one thing. Yeah, please, someone. Some of us feel that we, with the Iranians in Syria, we've reached a fork in the road for the Iranians, in that there's been a loss of, of, uh, of territory by the Assad regime, and that the Iranians face perhaps a choice whether to really get into a serious and encourage Assad into a serious political round or to double up and give him support on the ground. Um, what if, and it seems as if the indications are they're going to choose the latter. So then what does the United States do and what did the GCC states do? I'll come to you first, Ken, then I'll come to Hassan on this. Sure. Uh, I think this is a great question. I might use a slightly different analogy, Salman. Um, my experience of civil wars, my reading of the history of civil wars is that we're in a situation that maybe isn't necessarily a fork in the road, but it's certainly a moment of opportunity, right? And these civil wars tend to move in kind of a sine wave fashion or cyclical fashion. I think that you're right. The regime is on the ropes right now. And the, and the Iranians are going to have to make a decision as to whether or not they double down to try to save the regime. And it's at that, exactly that kind of a moment when the, the Iranians might be, I'll put it this way, most receptive to the idea of cutting their losses and striking a bargain uh, that would not necessarily leave Assad in power, in fact, I think would remove him from power, and would result in a Sunni majority government in Syria which would be much to the benefit of Syria and a negotiated settlement beyond that. Um, I think that you're right that it's unlikely that the United States is going to take advantage of that. I see absolutely nothing to indicate the Obama administration is going to try to take advantage of that. The one point I will make is that my point about it being a sign or a, a cyclical issue is I think we'll get here again. My guess is that because the U.S. won't take advantage of it, the Iranians will double down. And my guess is that, what the, Iran that the regime may lose some ground. I, I think it unlikely. I don't want to say never, but I think it unlikely that we're about to see the collapse of the regime, especially because I do think that the Iranians are going to be willing to support the regime, especially if they get no pushback from the United States. And what does the Gulf do? You know, I think that the Gulf has to ask itself the question of, do they want to continue to maintain this cycle of violence? I think many of the Gulf states are gonna answer that yes, because it's at least a way to bleed the Iranians, it's at least a way to support their brethren in Sunni, in, sorry, in, uh, their brethren Sunni in Syria. I think it's a way to not cede the field to the Iranians and their allies. But again, I think from the American perspective, you know, I, I'm thinking back to when I wrote Unthinkable. I went around the region, I spoke to all kinds of different heads of state, foreign ministers, et cetera, to talk to them about the Iranian nuclear threat. And I had the experience in every one of those meetings of speaking to prime minister, foreign minister, president, having them lay out their policy to me. And I would say to them, you realize that what you're doing is very dangerous and it could lead to this outcome or that outcome. And in every single case, what they said to me was, some, and this is a direct quote from one of those people, but every case they said to me some version of, yes, but you Americans aren't creating any better alternatives for us. That's the role that the United States is supposed to play. That's the role that we're failing to play, particularly in Syria. And that, of course, may explain the more active um, policy that King Salman, in particular, of Saudi Arabia is pursuing, but not just in Syria, but elsewhere. If the sun linked to that, um, I just want you to help, help define for us, from your perspective, your, your definitions of what are the security threats that are facing uh, the GCC. You, you've, you've spoken, of course, about Iran and Iran's role. Um, what are the others? Of course, Daesh, I, wish, I presume you would also. But what is the range of threats that GCC states um, collectively and also, of course, individually 
if, if you may, because I'm sure you would not put them all in one basket, perceived to, that are the ones that uh, require the kind of security coordination that you've been asking for? Uh, that is right. That is right. Before I answer your question, Salman, let's give things their proper names. The differences between the GCC countries and the US, the GCC countries did not create what is taking place in the region. They are not the factor behind the destabilization. This happened since the invasion of the US to Iraq. That was the point in which the problem has started. That was the starting point of sectarianism. And who has given Iraq to Iran? Is it the council, the GCC council, it is the toppling of Saddam Hussein, and there was a vacuum that was filled by Iran. Iraq at the time was a sectarian, a secular country at the time, and consequently, we are dealing with the, the traits. The uh, we're not dealing with a diagnostic kind of situation, and here I would like to remind you. I remind you about the Palestinian cause. And I would like also to add to that Al Yemen also. So these are wounds, open wounds. What we are doing is just giving them painkillers. As long as we keep doing that, we're going to keep on facing terrorism and terrorists. And here, the priorities are different. So the United States of America considers terrorism is a priority because it is the main threat to them. The GCC countries also considers it as one of the priorities. But they think, the GCC countries, that we have to try to look at the root cause to diagnose the situation. You cannot combat the problem without looking at the root cause. If you combat Daesh, you're going to have another Daesh because that's what had happened when we started fighting Al-Qaeda. After we started fighting Al-Qaeda, we have had Daesh. And this is the problematic issue that we have between the different countries of the GCC. So the jihadi groups and movements use these things as slogans to enlist the different mujahideens, as they call themselves, because they are having jihad uh, in order to retrieve uh, Palestine, to combat Bashar al-Assad, and to regain stability in the region when it comes to the balance between Shia and Sunni. And consequently, this difference is the one that has led to the fact that the United States deals with Iran and does not want to deal with the sectarian issues. So the question to be posed, what is the American strategy that would guarantee that Iran would stop exploiting the vacuums uh, in the region by creating sectarian problems, sectarian wars, and also sectarian expansion in the region. It wants to reach not only the Arab region, but also parts of Africa as well through its expansion. So as far as the GCC countries are concerned, they think that the United States of America does not understand the, the Iranian project. They want to have a central power in the region, a sectarian power in the region. And the United States of America only concentrates on the nuclear file without trying to put an end to this kind of sectarian expansion. It is yet another bomb which is similar to the threats posed by the nuclear po bomb. Yes, Iran is the first threat to the GCC countries. There is another issue that I would like to mention here, which is part of the difference between the United States and disagreement between the United States and the GCC. So 
the United States does not concentrate on the massacres that have been committed by the Shia. They only concentrate on the massacres that have been committed by the Sunni. What has been committed by Failaq Badr, the Badr Corps, and other uh, factions is also a similar in atrocity, if not more, than what has been committed by the Sunni groups. So in order to retrieve balance, it is very difficult to retrieve Iraq to what it used to be. But if I would like to try to have a kind of a federal solution in Iraq, uh, to have Shiaistan, Sunnistan, Kurdistan, this is not going to solve the problem because Shiaistan is going to be very much rich in oil. And Kurdistan would have some oil and Sunnistan would have no resources. And we're going to find ourselves yet again in the same circle. And of course, Iran is going to be the sponsor of Shiaistan, and maybe Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries would be supportive of Sunnistan. And yet again, we're going to see another proxy war, a war by proxy in the region. The United States of America is looking as one part of the image, and the GCC countries are calling for a complete complete image, uh, looking at the different granular details of the picture for us to be able to solve the problem. The United States of America, when it interferes, it creates a problem. And when it does not interfere or intervene, it also creates a problem. I think that we have to try to solve the Syrian situation. Maybe the destruction of the agencies and institutions in Iraq has made the, the United States to fear to destroy the states after the debatification and also the destruction of the different institutions of the states. This is a concern that make, makes the United States to accept uh, the smaller evil than to have the larger evil or the bigger evil, the smaller evil, which is Iran and Bashar al-Assad. So how can we solve the Syrian situation? And uh, Russia, of course, uh, in the Davos, uh, we had the uh, Deputy F uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, and I asked him a direct question. What is the price that Russia wants to get in order to find a solution in Syria? He was not able to answer me. You have a problem here. Iran is a regional power, and we have an international power, which is Russia. And the coming future for Syria, whether we like it or not, uh, Iran is going to be part of the solution, but Iran is not going to have or accept a solution that would not include a regime that should be an ally to itself. So I think we have to try to discuss the situation realistic, realistically. We should not try to find a solution in terms of wishful thinking. I, I want to ask you one more question, if Sam, before I come to Tammy on this. Last year, there were, there were differences within the GCC. Um, there was even accusations of interference in each other's affairs, and particularly around the issue of, um, of political Islam and Muslim Brotherhood. Are those now much lower on the agenda? Because you haven't mentioned yeah. that. Uh, in fact, uh, yes, uh, maybe, despite the, that the situation is very bad in Yemen, but one of the advantages of this situation is that led to this uh, uh, solidarity between the GC countries, forgetting their differences and accepting the statu quo, that it's in their interest uh, to, to that they can be uh, have different positions about some issues, but they should agree on some issues or the majority of issues, and this is what happened. The, in fact, today there is a very good rapprochement between the GC countries and an agreement about the regional issues, whether Yemen, Iraq, or Syria. And consequently, USA is now uh, can one of the advantages of this uh, 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 here. Uh, to be honest, it's say that the Omani uh, position is always different because this is a line they have uh, the, f from the past uh, to be it was neutral. So I can't say they all the uh, GC countries are uh, uh, 
coherent, but the other countries other than Oman are, have agreed on the priorities or what are the threats against their regional uh, security and consequently about uh, how they look into the, uh, about, uh, onto the Muslim Brotherhoods and Egypt. Each country will keep its own point of view, but this will not lead to breaking their alliance. That was great. Tammy, pick up on what was just said here. Um, also, you may want to comment on what was said a little bit earlier. But here, from the view from Washington as well, in terms of GCC coherence and their ability to take on these challenges and the extent to which they can challenge, take on these security, external security challenges that they face. What is the assessment there? Thank you. Well, I think Dr. Ibtisam just said something very important, which is that there is agreement amongst the states on the priorities in the security challenges because, of course, there are more than one security challenge. Um, but there's agreement now on what should be the priority. And that is quite different from the situation one year ago, two years ago, even three years ago. I travel to the Gulf, I travel to the region fairly frequently. And even a year ago, I would hear from some states, Iran is the priority, the number one threat, the most urgent. Some would say, you know, it's, uh, it's Bashar Assad. It's not Iran, it's Bashar. Some would say, it's Egypt. Um, and so I think, you know, I think if you look at the three threats that you laid out, or the three challenges the Gulf uh, is confronting, Iran, Daesh, and this division over political Islam. Different states put the priority on different amongst those three. And now everybody agrees Iran is at the top. Okay, I think that's something that the United States um, can respond to. Now, to be perfectly honest, I think the, the US government's focus on the nuclear file was a recognition that a nuclear Iran would be even more destabilizing even more uh, unbalanced in the region than a non-nuclear Iran, so that a nuclear Iran would be worse across all these dimensions. And yet, it took until a few months ago, really. It took until the beginning of March before the Obama administration began to speak publicly and regularly about these other dimensions of Iranian behavior that were problematic and that and to begin to reiterate the American commitment to confront these other challenges from Iran. So there's been some movement on the GCC side, there's been movement from Washington as well. Now to come to the question of GCC cooperation on security, uh, this is something of course Ken has studied in detail. Uh, what I will say is that this is part of a broader American perspective um, under this administration, which is partly uh, lessons that they have drawn from the experience in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last 10 years, but partly I think their response to changes in the global structure of politics and power, which is that while the United States is the largest global economy and the most powerful military in the world, that doesn't mean it is all powerful. Uh, and that in all of the regions where the United States has key strategic interests, it must rely on local partners who are the primary beneficiaries of security and the primary contributors to regional security. We've seen debates between the US and its European allies saying that the Europeans should be spending more on defense in their own budgets and relying less on American defense investments in Europe. And so there's been some of the same discussion, I think, between the US and the Gulf, not about spending, because the GCC does spend a tremendous amount of money on defense, but about capability, building up independent capability in the Gulf, building joint capability in the Gulf. And to me, this is an important agenda for the future, but Ken can tell us a lot more. Exactly, that's where I, Ken. In terms of even what came out of the Camp David, in terms of the renewed commitment to support training, the kind of missile shield, uh, do we have enough on the GCC side and enough from the US side in order to be able to build uh, a really robust 
security defense architecture in this current era? It's an interesting question, Salman, and I have to answer it by saying both yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the American presence all by itself is adequate to address any potential threat. As long as the United States maintains several Air Force squadrons and the ability to bring more in, as long as we retain a carrier in the North Arabian Sea or the, the Gulf and the ability to bring more in, the, as long as we have a couple of brigade sets in Kuwait and elsewhere in the region, that is more than adequate to de deter or defeat any Iranian threat to the Gulf. Any conventional threat, I should uh, specify that, be clear. They come by air, they come by sea, they come by the ground, they will lose badly and quickly. In that sense, we've satisfied the primary requirement of any security architecture. The Gulf states will be defended against a conventional Iranian military threat. But at another level, no, because obviously there's a lot more to it than that. And this, of course, is where we've been struggling. And this, I think, is where Dr. Ebdesam's original remarks are so important, because what we're seeing is the Gulf states, our Arab allies more generally, seeing a series of threats emanating that the United States is not addressing. And in fact, the United States is largely dismissing. Uh, and I think that part of the, the frustration, uh, I shouldn't be speaking for the Gulf states, this should be Dr. Edison, but at least it's my sense that part of the frustration of the Gulf states is in that dismissal by the United States, that these just aren't important threats, that we shouldn't be worried about them. And I think that we have to, to recognize that that is an area where we've got to do better. Again, for my mind, one area is to think about the civil wars, how do we address them better? I talked about Syria. I think that that is the obvious one, as both Tamara and you also uh, mentioned. That is a clear area where, where a much greater effort needs to be made to deal with the civil war and in so doing push Iran out. Dr. Ebdesam raised Iraq. Uh, on Iraq, I, my differences with the administration are not quite so enormous, but nevertheless, they are also important. But that's also an area where I will say that while the United States needs to do more, so too does the Gulf. You know, we need help. We need help with the Sunnis. We also need help with Baghdad. Uh, Baghdad is an incredibly complicated place. Um, I will start by saying that I'm not confident the Obama administration is going to get Baghdad right because they haven't gotten it right so far, very consistently. And we could really use a lot of help from our Gulf partners in, ba in Iraq as well. But then beyond that, there is a whole range of Iranian threats that are not conventional. There are the unconventional threats like missiles that I think we've actually got covered, right? We're doing quite well with the ballistic missile threat, and I think that the truth is that the Iranians are by and large deterred. But there are a whole range of other Iranian activities out there. You know, I, I made the point to our mutual boss this morning uh, in an email exchange. I said, you know, most of the weapons that we're selling to the Gulf states are designed to defeat the threat from the Iriaf and the Irin the Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force, and the Islamic Republic of Iran Navy. And the problem is, those aren't the threats. The real threat is from the Quds Force. Right? And that's where I think that we need to expand greatly. The Camp David Accords that was raised, but it was mostly raised in the, in the form of counterterrorism, it needs to go way beyond that. It needs to embrace counterinsurgency, anti-subversive activities. There's a whole range of additional activities where we need to expand that level of cooperation. And then just as a final point, and I know I'm opening a can of worms, but this will maybe open up questions that you can pursue. I, I think that we need to recognize, and Tamara was starting to make this point, that there is a fundamental debate in the United States about its perspective on the Middle East. And people, especially on the left, but some also on the far right, are calling into question this issue of just how close our interests are aligned with our allies in the region, to what extent should the United States be involved in the Middle East, how important is it to the United States? And I think that that raises a new set of questions about how we structure our defense relationship moving forward into the future. Yeah, just a, a quick addition, which is that I think there's, there's another dimension 
of U.S. GCC cooperation to advance regional security and to combat destabilizing behavior from Iran that's a non-military dimension. And I think this is also, you know, something that, that the administration has trouble explaining or communicating well um, or, or advocating well, which is that, look, we talk often about um, uh, one component of defending against terrorism is building resilience within our own societies, right? So that even because terrorists are a fringe movement, they prey on the margins, but if your society is strong and cohesive, a terrorist attack, even if it occurs, will not create wider conflict. It will not be devastating. Societal resilience is important when you're combating terrorism. It is much more important when you're combating subversion, which is what the GCC states tell us is the greatest threat they perceive from Iran. If you want to combat and prevent Iranian subversion, the greatest asset is the strength of your own society. Uh, just like if you want to combat ISIS, the greatest asset is the moderation and tolerance and pluralism of your own society. And this is not something that we can do with military tools, obviously, and importantly, it is not something on which the United States can lead. This is an area where the GCC states can lead, should lead, and must lead. And I think this is part of the message that's coming from Washington as well, although, as I said, I'm not sure they always do a good job of explaining it. Great, thank you. That's a very interesting point you raise, and at the time it'd be interesting to get your, your take on that in terms of in, inner society resilience to combat the kind of threats uh, that you face. I agree completely with what Dr. Tamara has just said. We really need to up, uh, apply the concept of citizenship in our societies and also try to disseminate the culture of tolerance and democracy before even building democratic institutions. We have to have a democratic culture. You cannot have democracy without having Democrats. But at the same time, on the other hand, those people who follow jihadists, the, the main problems are not internal problems for them. They have problematic issues to do with the region. And we have double standardness that is being used by the United States of America when it comes to dealing with the region. There is a lack of balance and also when they deal with the Palestinian cause. And this is part of the slogans that are being used. This has nothing to do with the internal issues of these countries. And this is not something that is mentioned only by the GCC countries. We have also to note that one part of the the people, some part of the people who enlist are from the GCC, but we have some other people who come from European countries. And these countries, they use uh, ideas of citizenship and tolerance. So what would make these European citizens join? Uh, they leave their own countries and they join Daesh. So the issue of Daesh, this is a new issue, which is the new kind of terrorism that we are facing. This is very complex and intricate indeed. There are some Arabs, Europeans, Westerners from Central Asia, the Mujahideen, as they call themselves, they are not only from one part of the world. That is why they call them Mujahideen, because they are fighting and they are fighting for a just cause. 
and they are fighting imperialistic powers, uh, as they call them, because they are not applying uh, principles of justice in the region. They are also fighting Iran, which is standing with the assassin Bashar al-Assad. This kind of intricacy, interrelated, complex relationship of the local, regional, and the international should be revised and reviewed if we would like to solve the situation. If we concentrate on only one component and we think that Daesh is only an Arab local phenomenon, we're not going to be able to find a solution to it. We have to look at the different dimensions, the regional, the local, and the international components and dimensions of Daesh for us to be able to find a solution. The United States of America was not able to defend this cause because they wanted to impose democracy through the use of parachutes. They cannot do that. If you, if you want to have democracy, you have to have good education, a good educational system, a system that relies on critical thinking that would teach people how to be able to critically look at things that would not take things for granted. And here, we will see the grassroots, the first seeds of the immunity of people from being influenced by any other ideas. If we do not take all these things into account, I would like to mention once again, we would like to see the whole picture. We should not look at just part of the picture because this is going to make us unable to see the rest of the problem and not be able to find a solution. We need to cooperate with the Americans, the Europeans, Russians, GCC countries, Arab countries. All of us should work together in order to find a solution to terrorism in the region. Um, briefly, before I hand it over to, to, to the audience, just a quick follow-up to the last thing you just said. Um, we've been talking about, of course, the U.S., and GCC relationship when it comes to security. But as I travel around the Gulf, and I think other, uh, other colleagues do, we increasingly have heard about diversification, diversification of relationships, of partnerships. It's not lost on many people, of course, that the vast energy resources from this region flow eastwards. Um, what, what chance is there, or how can other countries play that responsibility also of guaranteeing Gulf security, not just the United States. Uh, despite my disagreement with the many things uh, with the American administration, nevertheless, uh, 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 despite that, this uh, international order that we are living is an order uh, that uh, is uh, fluid, uh, but they have so many uh, poles, but nevertheless, the United States remain to be the major power, the main uh, power, and no one can, uh, uh, can challenge uh, it in that. Uh, consequently, um, the GCC countries might uh, go to the East, uh, China, or to Russia, or to France, to diversify their partnerships. Uh, and maybe part of the bitterness they feel regarding their relations with the United States, which were their main um, principal alliance, uh, but because the, the USA had uh, put them aside in the, in the nuclear deal with Iran. But the United States will remain to be a main pole and the main balance of uh, of the order, of the security order, regional security order in the region. Uh, and no other forces can uh, strike that uh, balance. Uh, I can say that uh, there, there are some free riders, free riders, uh, uh, free riders who don't have uh, for China. As for India, it could have some aspirations because there's a big fleet, uh, many time period that cannot be built, uh, and there is also uh, uh, many meetings between Israel and India that you cannot understand outside the framework of that the, uh, India wants to be a regional power. Uh, effective one, especially after an, uh, the United States announcement that the, about the pivot uh, that they are turning to the East uh, Asia.
Asia. And India also does not want to, this region should be controlled by one force such as Iran. That's why it, India thinks that it's qualified to be a partner in the uh, security uh, uh, arrangements of the region. Please, and then I want to ask Ken the same thing. On yeah, this. Just a, a quick addition on this, which is that you know, I think we see the, the challenges, even if the United States is, as Dr. Ibtisam was saying, the predominant international uh, external uh, influence on the region um, and provider of security in the region, we see the consequences when other major powers are at odds over regional issues. Look at Syria, look at what a disaster international action on Syria has been because of divisions within the Security Council. And look by contrast at how effective the sanctions on Iran have been because of unity amongst uh, global actors on the need to deal with the challenge of Iran's nuclear program. It is important, I think, that the US and the GCC not look at China and Russia as competitors with American involvement in the region, but that the US and GCC work together to ensure that Russia and China are playing a constructive role in the region rather than a destructive role. Great, Ken, you've done some quite a bit of work on this recently. Thank you, Salman. Yeah, I, I might put it slightly differently, Tammy. I, I might start by saying that I think this is an important thing to recognize. It goes back to a point that Dr. Abdesam was starting to make, which is that I think we need to recognize that China and India in particular, but potentially some other countries, are simply going to become greater players in the Middle East. Uh, they have enormous interests here, and we're seeing them express that interest. And I think that the question or the issue, as Tamara just laid it out, is whether they are going to be productive, responsible, constructive players in this region, or whether they're going to be destructive and divisive players. I will start by saying that I believe that Russia under Vladimir Putin will be a destructive, divisive player. I do not think that the Russians are here to help. And I think that part of the problem is that Russia doesn't share the interests that the rest of us do in this part of the world. Uh, one of the nice things about China and India is that they share the American GCC interests in the region. We want to see stability. We don't want to see violent revolutionary change. We don't want to see, we don't, but I think that we can convince the Chinese, and I think that they recognize this too, that Iranian expansion is not in their interest either. It will destabilize the region, and most importantly for the Chinese, it will help pump up the cost of oil which they don't want and which, of course, the Russians do want. So I think that we need to recognize that Chinese and Indian involvement in the region is going to happen. The real question, Mark, is how to ha make that happen. I will simply finish by saying that I also do believe it is the case that the United States will remain the dominant player in the region for the foreseeable future, at the very least for the next five or 10 years. I suspect perhaps for longer than that, but again, my crystal ball gets hazy at that point in time. But that said, I think that it's also important for the United States to be thinking about this because as I mentioned before, we are having a debate in the US. Tamara mentioned this earlier. There is a real set of questions as to how much of a burden the United States wants to continue to shoulder in the Middle East, with some on both the far left and the far right arguing for a diminished involvement in the region. I don't know where we're going to end up, but I suspect that moving forward, one of the best ways that the United States could deal with its own domestic reluctance is to help bring the Chinese and the Indians in in the right way, to make clear to them, to help them to understand where their interests lie and how those interests are best served. Because if we can do that, if we can bring China and India, the rising powers into the region and help them to understand that their interests are the same as ours and the GCCs, all of us working together would be an enormously powerful force. Great, thank you. I suspect what you said at the first part of that sentence, that the US role may well diminish it would fill a lot of people here with a lot of nervousness, but at the same time, this work of trying to build a concert of states to guarantee security may well give us something to chew on and to work towards. Okay, 
I'm sure many of you will do a better job than me in asking the questions, so I'll start with <coughs> Dr. Sultan Barakat. <laughs> if you could please, otherwise, just let me know your affiliations and your names, that would be great. Uh, first of all, can I start by thanking the panelists for uh, uh, excellent uh, presentations, very insightful. Uh, the question really is addressed to Dr. Ebtisam. Uh, why can't the GCC go directly to Iran to talk about common security strategy for the Gulf? Why do they have to portray this dependent attitude towards, you know, in front of the rest of the world, dependence on, on the U.S.? And, and uh, related to that, why do we fear Shia or Shiaism as a madhab? The madhab is in people's minds, people's hearts, and sh clearly they have the freedom, those to choose it, they, they should have the freedom of choosing it. And there was a time when Al-Fatimiyya, the whole Middle East, followed that particular way of thinking within Islam. Uh, isn't it time that we kind of change all this uh, discourse and uh, somehow project a more confident uh, position so that others respect the Gulf and the Arab world for what it stands for rather than what we'd like them to, to do on, on our behalf. Um, and, and I think the starting point is looking back at the negotiations. The GCC should have been part of that negotiations and maybe this is where the US got it wrong that uh, to be doing it behind closed doors, the P5 plus one, without the immediate neighbors of Iran, gave uh, rise to the suspicion uh, within the Gulf states and other Arab states. And maybe now it's not too late, now that they work out the details of this deal, the GCC should be requesting some kind of status around the table so that they are, so the deal is transparent in front of them and uh, their fears are, are laid aside. Thank you. Why wouldn't the GCC countries go to Iran instead taking the United States as a mediator? We had track two that included non-official representatives from both parties. The difference of mentalities, the Iranians like so this was in order to build trust between the two parties. That was the main objective at the beginning. The Iranians, we have so many, I mean, steps that should be followed in order to build trust and confidence. You cannot start a dialogue on pending issues such as the Emirati Islands. These are the taboos that we cannot talk about. Iraq is a taboo also. Syria is a taboo. You cannot talk about it. So what remains? What remains to talk about? And this doesn't mean that our relationship is cut or severed. No, we have relationships with Iran. And here I would like to talk about Oman, a good relationship. And we have a severed relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And we have some in-between kind of situation between Kuwait and Iran, Qatar and Iran, and to some extent the Emirates and Iran when it comes to the economic level. The problem is that Iranians have the a kind of a commercial mentality. So you buy words, but you don't get anything in you don't get anything in return. So they sell you words, but you don't get anything. They don't implement anything. And this was discussed in Camp David. They said that in the coming phases, we have to be present. And the point of difference, when the sanctions are lifted, this, the lifted, this is going to be also a kind of concern for the GCC countries. So they have injected 30 million in Syria while under uh, the sanctions. And also they had, have had other adventures in other places. What about Iran when it regains all its power, when it has no sanctions? What is it going to do? As for the second topic, which is Shiism, 
I do not think that we have any problem with Shiism. We have the a problem with the twelfth uh, sect uh, or the twelver sect, uh, because they want all Shias in the world to be twelvers. I mean, the Houthis are Zaydis, uh, but they are not twelvers. Uh, and you do not understand why. Why does uh, Iran give uh, the Abadis a seat in Qum? The Abadis are not Shia, they are Khawarij. So Iran is exploiting uh, these people. So there is a kind of a political Shiaism. Hamas is not Shia, it is Sunni. And despite all that, Iran is helping Hamas. This is kind of political Shiaism. Al-Qaeda is not Shia. Al-Qaeda is one of the uh, worst enemies, arch enemies of Iran. So the GCC countries, they do not want to use this sectarian uh, note. Uh, the Shia in the GCC, they are not Twelvers. Uh, and uh, Al-Itna Asharia or the Twelvers, they have so many what we call bid'a or uh, innovations that have nothing to do with religion uh, in essence. Uh, this is a kind of politicization. politicization. Uh, and this is the problematic issue that we are facing here in the region. Why not go directly to Iran? Gentlemen, sir, please your name and affiliation. And if you could please keep to a question as closely as you can, that would be great. Farid Trabulsi, I am... Uh, Farid Trabulsi. Farid. I have some comments for our friends here. We are talking about US foreign policy. And last year on this platform, we had uh, Martin and uh, when he's, I asked him, I think, or Dr. Zakaria asked him, what are the access of US foreign policy in the Middle East? And the uh, GCC region or the Gulf region is part of the Middle East. He said four, and he listed them. Number one was security of Israel. Number two was oil. Number three was oil. And number four was oil. And that was on record. <laughs> I mean, in this whole speech about the future of security in the region, we did not, I mean, uh, hear a word about Israel, which is the main enemy of the Arab world. And all the destabilization that happened in the Arab world, we. In our generation, we refer it to Israel. We are suffering from the inconsistency of the foreign policy of the US. I remember in December 78, President Carter and uh, Mrs. Carter spent Christmas with the Shah of Iran. Three months later, Khomeini was in, uh, in March 79, he was in Tehran. And the whole re uh, reason was because the US was fighting communism in Afghanistan, and they thought that religion is the main weapon, anti-communism, and this is how the, uh, what, you, what I can say from that uh, time I, was, I lived it, you know, they have uh, pleased the generals of the Shah not to oppose Khomeini because his role was to fight the communism in Iran. His agenda was different, definitely, and we are suffering it from today. And this is on record. Dr. Ibtissam, she was very, uh, uh, I mean, thankfully mentioned the Palestinian issue on, uh, on this. But I think, you know, from the history and of the US foreign policy in the whole region, the Arab world, Muslim world, is based on the security of Israel. Now, Iran, under the Shah was not a threat. He took the islands from uh, the Emirates, and this is a taboo. Uh, I mean, Shiism, like uh, Dr. Ibtissam said, you know, is not a threat. It is very political, and Dr. Barakat mentioned. In, 19, in 1094, the Crusaders came to the region. The Fatimid uh, Caliphate was Please. in power, and the head of the army was a Sunni, and they ruled the whole world from Egypt the Arab world for 200 years. The whole literature of the, of the time, we don't have the word Sunni Shia. Today is being created to disintegrate the, uh, our communities. And 
one last thing. Please, please. Just one, one point, Dr. Salman. Please, really quickly, because I've yes. given you a long time. Saddam, here. you know, mistake <laughs> was when he persecuted the Shias and the center of Shiism in the world moved from Karbala and Najaf to Qom. And this is the, the gain that Iran took from, uh, from Saddam. I think, I mean, there are a lot of things to comment, but I think it is the inconsistency, you know, and not the stability of the U.S. foreign policy we are suffering it, uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll take one more question, but a question, please, Dr. Zakaria. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll come. We'll, yes, we'll take the gentleman in the back, and I'll come to you for a comment at the end. I promise you. Thank you. <clears throat> Your name and affiliation, if any, please. I'm uh, Captain David Walker from the United States Army Civil Affairs. Uh, I think a, a very important point was raised about how uh, grievances in this, in this region underlie the, uh, the vulnerability to subversion. Uh, I think another very important point was made, though, that the international character of uh, individuals drawn to extremist organizations indicates that the grievances are more than uh, just local, um, more than the kind of local grievances that you find in counterinsurgency manuals. Um, so my question is, what are specifically some of those grievances that make the countries of this region vulnerable to subversion? And very importantly, to what extent are those grievances very large macro issues like the Sykes-Pigot Agreement um, that are very, very difficult uh, to, to address without the kind of unified action uh, on the international stage that has been uh, elusive. Thank you. I mean, why don't we start with you first? Sure. Well, let me um, give a response that I think might address both of your, both of your uh, interventions, which is that I think this point, which Dr. Ibtissam made and Captain Walker just repeated, is an important one, which is that we see extremists driven by local grievances and by things that are definitely not originating in the Middle East, right? The flow of foreign fighters from Europe, smaller flow from the United States, but there is also uh, that phenomenon from the United States. It's hard to explain in terms of regional grievances or local grievances, yes. And what this means, it, it's what it suggests to me at least, is that there's a clear division of labor here. Um, the, what drives radicalization is a, a question that I think governments here, governments in the West, are seized with right now. They're struggling with, and it is incredibly complicated to answer. The role of economics, the role of education, the role of psychology, um, but what we can see is that there are problems here that help drive it, and there are problems elsewhere that help drive it, and so we both have a role to play in ameliorating this problem, in reducing the vulnerability of our, our young people to radicalization, in tamping down conflict, in building cultures, as Dr. Ibtissam was saying, culture of pluralism, culture of democracy, culture of tolerance. What this really, where I come down on this then is that <laughs> with all due respect, I remember the Iranian revolution as well. Um, but the majority of this region, Iranians and Arabs were born after the revolution, okay? We, we have to move beyond this debate about whose fault is it? Is it your fault or is it our fault? We have a problem all of us, that's affecting our shared interests. We all have a role to play. Our societies share responsibility for this problem as the foreign fighters issue demonstrates and we share responsibility for solving it. Um, so yes, are there issues of inconsistency in American policy in the region? Absolutely, show me a great power that has fully consistent foreign policies. I could point to inconsistencies in the policies of regional states as well, particularly with respect to Iran and Iraq, by the way. Uh, that's what states do. But if we can recognize that we have 
shared issues at stake, shared interests, and shared responsibility, I think we can move forward to constructive solutions. Well, I, I think that includes responsibility for addressing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and I think that this administration has tried quite hard <laughs> repeatedly, including my boss, Ambassador Indyk, personally has invested a great deal of his life in uh, American attempts to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we are not there yet. We have now on the ground, both in Israel and in uh, Palestine, leaders who, for the moment, are not interested in re-engaging in a direct diplomatic process. And so we have to ask ourselves, what role do we play given that, right? Is there a different kind of process that we should structure? Uh, what can we learn? What lessons can we learn from the exhaustion and collapse of the Oslo framework for negotiations? And how do we build something new so that Israelis and Palestinians can also move on to a constructive future? Thank you. Also interesting, President Obama's comments in the last 24 hours or so where he said if there isn't a peace process, um, we won't necessarily be able to continue to wield a veto in the UN Security Council as the French and others are putting together resolutions to that effect. Uh, Ken, do you want to go to that, also that question, why not talk directly to Iran? Before we get that, I just want to pick up on some points that Tamara made and in effect make the same points, make them slightly differently. That said, I, I do want to start by saying that, uh, much as I love and respect Martin Indyk, uh, I might have uh, changed the hierarchy of those interests. For me, it would have been oil, 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 then probably Israel, right? And I would have put other things on the list, too, and I think most Americans would add terrorism to that list as well. Um, and here again, I want to echo a point that Tamara made, but maybe perhaps make it slightly differently, which is to say that as longtime friends and allies, we should recognize that ultimately, we do have some very different interests in the region. At the end of the day, you don't share our interest in Israeli security. And your interest in oil is different from our interest in oil. That doesn't mean, though, that we cannot be friends, that we cannot be allies. Many of the greatest alliances in history have been among countries with very different interests. Let's set it, you know, the obvious one is the Soviet Union during uh, World War II, or Russia during World War I, but just France and Britain. Uh, France and Britain saw the world very differently. France and Britain hated each other and fought each other for hundreds and hundreds of years. But by the time of the 19th century, they realized that they had some very important things in common, and they forged a very important set of alliances that have continued to this day. And yet they still talk badly about each other. I think they talk much worse about each other than we talk about uh, each other, the US and the GCC. You can't ask us to change our interests any more than we can ask you to change yours. What we need to do is to find common ways to move forward, exactly tomorrow's point. And we've done that. For the past 60 years, we have done, I think, a pretty good job of recognizing the commonalities that we see out there, the common threats, the common aspirations, and of using those to forge common policies. Are there inconsistencies? Again, as Tamara said, absolutely. Some of that stems, as she pointed out, simply from being a nation in the world. Uh, a great American diplomat once pointed out that di diplomacy is all about hypocrisy. It's about trying to get the other guy to do something that you wouldn't do yourself, right? That is the definition of hypocrisy. Uh, but at the end of the day, we both need to be consistent to our interests, to our values. At times, I think that the United States has lost its way and pursued things that weren't in its interest and to its values. I think that's true also of many Middle Eastern states. The idea is to get beyond it. I agree with Tamara, where Israel comes in, we have an interest in Israeli security. We also have an interest in diminishing the Arab-Israeli tension, and if possible, ending the Arab-Israeli conflict. That would be great for the United States. Frankly, it'd be great for the Israelis and the Arabs too. But for me as an American, that's almost a secondary consideration. And I will just say, I worked for President Clinton, who invested everything in bringing about Arab-Israeli peace, and I think he was right to have done so. And I think that both the George W. Bush 
and the Barack Obama administrations have failed miserably in not investing more. But the last one I'll make on that, and then I will be glad to say something about talking directly to the Iranians, the last one I'll make on that is, I think it is very clear that the United States cannot do it alone. You can say that, yes, the United States should pressure Israel more, and we have there at times pressured Israel more. Uh, at times we haven't, and I would agree that there, that on uh, many occasions we should have uh, done so, but there have been times when we absolutely have pressured Israel very hard. At the end of the day, it isn't enough. We need help. We need help from the Europeans, and we need help from our allies in the Arab world. Arab-Israeli peace is an enormous problem. It's not going to be solved by the United States alone. Last, on the issue of talking directly to Iran. Here I'll come back to another issue that you raised, Salman, which is how we think about security in the region. And here, I think that one of the things that we need to aspire to, Dr. Abdesam, I think, was very eloquent in, in talking about the need for political cultural transformation before there can be real embrace of democracy, how critical that is to shifting uh, the values, the educational, I think it's absolutely true. I think another goal that we need to have along those similar lines is a security framework for the region that is inclusive, not exclusive. This is the lesson that we and the Europeans learned after 40 years of the Cold War. We had the Helsinki process and ultimately the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which was absolutely critical to the successful conclusion of the Cold War. In that, we brought the Russians into the process. It's something we need to be thinking about with the Iranians. It's not something that can happen right this minute, but down the road, we need to think about a security framework that's going to bring the Iranians in, that's going to allow them to address their security concerns, and they do have some legitimate security concerns, in a framework of dialogue and arms control, rather than through aggression and subversion. It's a long-term goal, but we need to be thinking about that, and that direct contact is absolutely critical. As I said, it was critical to the end of the Cold War. It was critical to bringing about, ultimately, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. And I don't think that we're going to see positive change with Iran unless we can move in that direction, ultimately, as well. Thank you very much. I'll only take issue with you on one thing. As a Brit married to a French woman, <laughs> we talk just fine. <laughs> Um, do we have any one more question before I wrap? Uh, is, uh, yeah, I promised you. Please. But, but a brief comment, please. Yeah, a brief comment, please. So, so you allow me to speak in Arabic because uh, directly to Dr. Tsam, okay? I would like to thank you, Dr. Abtissam, for your wonderful words about uh, uh, democracy. I'm a liberal opposer of a CC. You posed questions and you said how terrorism was established. I used to be a lecturer during the first Afghan war when they put the paradise under the feet of Rabbani and Hikmatyar and those who go there would go to paradise. Uh, the United States and, and the GCC, they have spent 90 billions. Uh, so they have created these people, they have killed them and now they have become like uh, uh, crazy dogs uh, why we are spending all these billions of dollars uh, you also ask another question you said there is Daesh and Dawaish which means many many Daesh I when a CC uh, he said uh, to the GCC countries when he took your money after that he said uh, uh, that you are just half countries after taking all your money he is a traitor and i apologize on his behalf uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is going to transform Egypt into Daesh. He kills his people, he detains his people, uh, and he deprives people from expressing themselves. He is raping women. All these people are going to be transformed into Daesh with the money that you gave us, al-Sisi, and with the support of the free world. Not I would like just to say 
that the GCC countries are not supporting a CC. The GCC countries are supporting Egypt and the stability of Egypt. Uh, the stability of Egypt is very important to the GCC countries, whether we agree or disagree. I think uh, when we look into the aid, the aid is not military aid, uh, the aid is developmental aid. And here we can argue and say that the GCC countries go to build, uh, uh, I mean, educational infrastructure and also health infrastructure. And I would like to reassure you that our money, we are much more uh, wiser than the Egyptians because we are the ones who are implementing our own projects by ourselves, we are not giving them as endowments. It is our companies that are implementing the projects that we are uh, that that we uh, that, that we are financing. Sit. and it's problematic for me. Uh, um, the issue that oil is the main priority. Yes, the United States of America does not rely on the oil from the GCC. So how would it become a priority number one, priority number two, priority number three for the United States of America? And there is an issue here. We have to understand that this oil is for the affluence and development of Europe and also the development of China and Asia, since China is uh, the most important creditor for the United States of America. And also, we have to be keen to keep uh, development continuing in the world. And this is not important uh, for, for the United States of America because they have started, they stopped using our oil for years. I promised you a, a high level discussion with this very classy and high level panel and very charming panel. So thank you uh, very much. And that's you, Ken. Uh, for, um, for, for your comments. I think, I think what we've heard today um, is very much as, uh, an indication of where we are, an enduring but nervous relationship, um, where there is real concern about the balance in this region, uh, the need for greater strategic realignment, particularly to face the certain threats, particularly Iran, we heard Iran, but also the focus on Syria, we also heard that the GCC agreement is much more lined up on its own priorities, which I think is, uh, as uh, Tamara pointed out, I think is extremely significant. And the changes that we have to understand that the US itself is going through and its own perception of its responsibilities with both uh, domestic politics and a focus on local partners and what they can do. Um, and of course, that the US cannot do it alone. I think this is what we've heard over and again. So we had also a discussion on what are the unconventional ways perhaps that we should be or new ways to build security, whether it's domestically related to societal resilience or diversification of partnerships or how you can bring those to work um, in the future. And, and then finally, I'll, I'll rest with what um, uh, both Ken and Tammy said in terms of inclusive security processes and the shared responsibilities, uh, the shared issues and the shared interests that there are still uh, going forward, at least for the foreseeable future. So I wanted to sum all that up because I think it was a very rich discussion and I think we should bear uh, some of those very important conclusions in mind. Let me thank uh, the guests who are with us um, for your excellent contributions and I would welcome you all to join us outside for some refreshments. Thank you.